uh, this morning I'm going to be speaking on the, the resurrection, part three. Uh, if you remember part one and part two, we did a few weeks ago. Uh, and again, all this, this came out of last, the last series I did from 1 Corinthians. And I think I, I was struck with how the Corinthian church, uh, there were people in the Corinthian church who denied the resurrection. And it got me thinking, I, I, I think with, with church history and, and the, the benefit of 2,000 years of church tradition, I don't think we deny the resurrection. But I, 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 I think sometimes we maybe don't know what to do with the resurrection. How does it shape our lives? How does it impact our testimony? How does it change what we say to people? Uh, I, I had an interesting discussion with a patient on Friday. Uh, um, she has a different background. Um, and the, the sticking point was the hope that I have in Jesus' resurrection. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a very clear difference uh, in people's lives if you have that hope or, or not. Um, so yes, so, so cast your minds back to the last series on 1 Corinthians, how the, the early church, the early Christians, uh, were at risk of denying the resurrection. Our first part in the resurrection was our assurance. So the assurance that we have of who Jesus is and what he has done. Because without the resurrection, there's also there's no salvation. And to understand the resurrection, we need to understand sin and death and temptation, and that the resurrection overcomes all of this. And last time we looked at the resurrection as our transformation. And I asked, can, can we change? You know, some of us struggle with that change, that transformation. Uh, we want to change, and we need to change. Uh, we, looked at, we saw that through the pattern of biblical salvation history, God is always bringing new life from the dead, uh, calling things that are not as though they were. Uh, God brought new life from nothing in the creation. God brought new life from old people, Abraham and Sarah. God brought new life for a dead nation, Israel. And God brings new life that will never end. From that pattern of salvation history we see in the Bible, we see that God is always bringing new life to the dead. So yes, we can change because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Today we're going to look at our hope, uh, how the resurrection also forms our hope. And I'll just ask that Sarah brings us the reading. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Very good. So I uh, asked the question, uh, what, what have you hoped for this week? We're, we're always hoping for this and that. We're hoping for the rain to stop or the rain to start again. <laughs> just to start, yeah. Uh, hoping that that parcel that I arrived, uh, that I ordered might arrive in the mail this week. But these things are pretty insignificant, aren't they? They, they, they do happen. They're not based on our hope. Um, so let, let's look at the Bible's definition of hope. For the Bible speaks of hope as something that we have. It is about looking forward to eternity with Christ. That there is no risk or disappointment with this one. There, there's no chance that your hope can be dashed or ruined by anyone. Unlike all our other expressions of hope, this is a hope that won't disappoint us. Uh, it is guaranteed by God, and it bears his signature, uh, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Th- this sort of hope makes living possible, for it gives us a future. So we, we need a future, and we need to have hope. What about the flip side? Have you ever felt that you had no hope? Or that your hopes were dashed or, or ruined by someone or, or something? Uh, I, I'd assume that there are people here this morning who have had their hopes utterly devastated, by circumstances or other people. Uh, maybe some life ambition has come unstuck or some goal that you've wanted to achieve has been blocked. Or maybe you've been in a very dark place where there seemed to be no hope at all. So that, that is a hopelessness based on our worldly situation and that does need to be acknowledged. As Christians, we are a people of hope uh, and this is hope that is a guarantee from God. And it's all because of the resurrection. This hope is different to our worldly lives because this is a living hope and it's based on an event that's already happened, Jesus' resurrection. So I think we really need to understand and get a good grasp of this, how the resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago still gives us a future hope, even today. We need to understand this and get it right because the early church got it wrong. But they got it so terribly wrong in a few ways, so we can learn from their mistakes. 
There were some in the early church that taught that the resurrection had already taken place. Uh, This was some of the teaching going around at the time. According to this false teaching, uh, it wasn't just that Jesus' resurrection, just in his own physical self, but they taught that everything about the resurrection had already happened, had already been fulfilled, and that there was no future event to take place. That there was no future hope, was there? There was nothing left to hope for. Paul describes these two false teachers as having wandered from the truth. We, we don't know exactly how or when, but we can see that their teaching may have looked and sounded like Christian teaching, but it was not of God. They turned the resurrection hope into a thing of the past, and in doing so, that they ruined Christian hope and faith. That was some teaching in the early church, and we read about that in 1 Corinthians. This teaching can also be prevalent nowadays as well. There's some people who say that we have it all now. Uh, some people say that um, all that we hope for in the resurrection is available right here, right now. They might say that all the fullness of what we long for can actually be enjoyed right now. They will teach that there's nothing left to wait for. We can experience it, all of it now. We don't even need to wait for full victory over sin. Uh, they say we can experience heaven right here, right now. All you have to do is have a little faith, believe it, and you'll receive it. So this kind of teaching and thinking wanders from the truth. For it misunderstands what we receive and when. As, as we will see, it ignores the blessing that are ours, the blessings that are ours in Christ, for, but for which we must wait. Yes, there is so much to enjoy right now. The reality of forgiveness, relationships being reconciled and restored. We can enjoy the presence and ongoing work of God's Spirit. But we still must wait for the end before we enjoy the fullness of what we have in Christ. So there are some false teachers that would claim that we have it all now. Another current one is this is all there is. There are some who will say that the the resurrection was just a a metaphor, just an idea. It will not really happen when we die, just some idealistic picture of what could possibly happen if we're all just spiritually resurrected. Uh, this, people who hold this view, they say that this world is all there is. Heaven and hell are not realities, but just the very best and the very worst of this world. And they also teach that there is no future resurrection for us. And we are not waiting for any future miraculous intervention in this world by God. How depressing. <laughs> how hopeless. And how so very wrong. Uh, this kind of teaching and thinking ignores scriptural truth and Christian experience. Because we know that the resurrection is not a fiction, it is a fact. There are specific people, specific dates and times and places mentioned. The historical record proves it. This kind of false teaching and thinking also considers the miracles as just fables. That they didn't really happen, or not in miraculous ways, and they're not meant to be taken literally. Uh, These false teachers reject the notion of miraculous intervention by God. And so they're forced to come up with other naturalistic explanations of how things things might have happened. This thinking is is limited by the material reality, by what we can only see and touch. These people might believe in God, but they place limits on his power. It's not a good place to be, is it? (laughs) Back to the early church, one more mistake that they made is they claimed there was no resurrection from the dead. As we looked at in in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Uh, Who who remembers the last series uh, on 1 Corinthians? And I listed all the problems of the Corinthian church. How many were there? Twelve? Lots? I think it was 11 or 12. Well, this is a big one, den- denying the resurrection. Uh, and it was actually being taught in the church that there was to be no physical resurrection to come. Th- this kind of false teaching comes from the, the false belief that the spiritual world was so much more important than the physical, that, that our physical bodies are just so entirely corrupt that they're not worth worrying about. 
some of these people with this false teaching, they had such a low view of the physical body and they viewed their physical bodies as worthless. So they, they were quite happy to sleep around with prostitutes and commit other sexual sin because in their thinking it didn't really matter. So how did Paul address this? Well, we saw in the last series, Paul reminded them that they had been bought at a great cost, the death of Jesus, and that they now belonged to Jesus. So how they used their bodies was a reflection of their view of Jesus. Yes, we are to honour God with our bodies. We, are, we, also, we always need to lower our view of sexual sin and elevate our view of marital sex because our bodies belong to Jesus right now. He has plans for them. Our bodies have a future. They will be physically raised and transformed. So we do have a physical hope and the resurrection confirms that goodness of what God has made. We we need to truly understand our own physical resurrection to come because our, our hope for the future is bound up with the nature of Jesus' resurrection in the past. We can only look forward to our own resurrection if we look first back uh, to his. The significance of Jesus' bodily resurrection shows us the nature of our bodily resurrection. So what if, what if the resurrection of Jesus never happened? Let's, let's uh, put forward an alternative. What if Jesus has not been raised? Well, if Jesus has not been raised, then all our preaching is worthless. It's pointless. Uh, Our belief is wrong. We're on the wrong track, aren't we? Why are we all here? Many people say that that all religions are the same. All different ways to get to God. Different different paths up the the mountain, at the top they all meet. Or there are many rivers that flow into the sea. It's the same sea. So People think all religions get to the same end point. But the thing with the Christian faith is that it's so bound up with history so much more than any other world religion or belief. Uh, If you know anything about Buddhism, uh, Buddhism has a bit of a a cloudy uh, basis for its origins. There's lots lots of debate, so much more debate in Buddhism than Christianity. And you you could set out to try and prove that the founder of Buddhism didn't exist. Some people have done that. It's very hard to prove it either way. But even if you proved that the founder of Buddhism didn't really exist. It wouldn't change the nature of Buddhism. It wouldn't change their teachings and their practices. They would still practice the same. So their, their, their historical record doesn't really matter. Not so with Christianity. Because the Christian gospel is grounded in history. And it has everything to do with particular historical events, people and places and times. But most importantly, the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus. You can, you can prove that the Christian faith is futile. All you have to do is prove that Jesus never existed, prove that he, he wasn't crucified, and prove that he never rose again. Who wants to try and do that? Pro- prove that Jesus never existed, prove that he wasn't crucified, and prove that he never rose again. If you could do any of these things, then Christian, the Christian faith would fall right apart. Paul's preach would be useless and we would all be just wasting our time by sharing what Jesus had done in our lives. And don't just feel sorry for Paul, but if Christ Jesus is still dead, then we have a serious issue. We would still be dead in our sins. Again, many people say these days that it's important to have faith in something, to have some kind of spiritual belief, something to lean on when life gets tough. Well, uh, that it shouldn't really matter what your faith is in exactly, but just have a little faith. Some people claim you just need a little faith to get you through life. Uh, Well, the Bible disagrees because there is just such a thing as futile faith, a faith that is absolutely worthless. And the question we should be asking ourselves is not, do I have faith, but what is my faith in? You see, what matters is, is not the presence of faith, but it's the object of that faith. Sincerity is not enough, but you can be sincerely wrong. Sincere faith in something hopeless is not going to get you anywhere. It is possible to have a faith that is worthless, 
For if Christ has not been raised, that is the exact kind of faith that we would have. If Christ is still buried in that, in that tomb, then there is no point to being a Christian. Again, why are we all here? Sincerity would make no difference. We may sincerely feel the love and acceptance of God, but if Jesus is not alive, we are still in our sins. He claimed his death would be our ransom, but if his death was the end, then we have no reason to think his crucifixion achieved anything. Again, if, if there's no resurrection, there is no salvation, and we are still dead in our sins. Shall we consider the alternative? Let's suggest that Jesus has been raised, <laughs> uh, as the historical record proves. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, we read, but, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Now there's a lot going on in these verses, but the main point is this, is that the resurrection of Jesus was not a one-off event. Jesus' resurrection was to be the first of many. All who are in Christ we made alive, and his resurrection shows us what will happen to all the rest. His is the guarantee and demonstration of what is to come for those who trust in him. Where he goes, we will also follow. And Paul goes on. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Jesus is the King of all, and his resurrection typifies what will happen to those who follow him. But in another sense, it's still very unique. You see, Jesus' resurrection demonstrates his lordship a sign that all his enemies are at last under his feet. And by overcoming death, Jesus has shown that his death itself will one day be destroyed. So it's clear that, that the resurrection forms a basis of our hope that we possess as Christians. And as we look back at the basis of our hope, we can then look forward to what is the result of our hope. Our hope that our bodies will also uh, undergo resurrection in the future. Because just like Jesus, we are also to be raised physically from the dead through faith, as we have seen. We are united to him and his spirit dwells within us. The spirit within us is the spirit of resurrection and what the spirit did in raising Jesus, he will do for us. We are guaranteed bodily resurrection. The next step in understanding resurrection is to understand, uh, sorry, is to look at the nature of Christ's resurrected body. That this, this raises many questions, doesn't it? You know, when we are resurrected, what age will we be? What language will we speak? Will we eat food? Will we have hair? Do you, do you think of those sorts of questions? I, I do. <laughs> Haven't got any answers yet, but it, it does raise so many questions. We could ponder those things to the cows come home. Um, But let's let's look at the risen Christ. Uh, For just as there is a connection between us and Adam, Paul shows us that there is also to be a connection between us and the risen Jesus, the new Adam. Jesus' bodily resurrection tells us about ours, that he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The Gospel accounts show us that there are similarities and differences with, his pre, with Jesus' pre-resurrection body. He still bore the scars so that they recognised him. He ate with them and broke bread with them. But 
he was not immediately recognisable to them. Uh, there was two disciples who shared a long journey with him, talking with him, and only at the end they realised it was Jesus. Uh, Jesus could pass through locked doors. That would be a great power to have. Uh, Jesus was less bound by the physical limitations of, of normal human experience. His body had changed. So if we look at the risen Christ, this is some indication of what we also have to look forward to in our own bodily resurrection. I will be recognisably and authentically me, but I'll be a transformed me. I'll be more fully myself than I've ever been. I'll be perfectly who God always intended me to be. Continuing on, uh, Paul says also, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body. Just breaking those four things down. My body now is dishonorable, uh, sorry, perishable. Uh, one day, my body will fall apart and decompose. <laughs> uh, in the prime of our lives, we may feel strong and indestructible, but one day, people will stand at our graveside. Our bodies will die and decay. They're not designed to go on forever. And they're like mobile phones these days. They're only designed to last a couple of years. <laughs> is that right, Peter? Yep. <laughs> then you have to replace them. You have to upgrade, and then that becomes obsolete too. (laughs) Our fallen bodies are the same. They only function for a limited time. Death is inevitable. But not so with our resurrection bodies. They will be imperishable, and they will go on forever. My body now is dishonourable. Our bodies have been a vehicle for sin. We've used our feet to go where we shouldn't have. We've used our eyes to look on things we shouldn't have. We've used our tongues to say things we shouldn't have said. In Romans, Paul says that we've offered parts of our bodies to sin as instruments of wickedness. Our bodies have all been damaged by sin, bruised, misused, abused, neglected. Our bodies have become dishonourable, but our new bodies will be raised in glory. Rather than bearing the memories and marks of sin, they will shine And they will just be like Jesus' glorious body. My body now is weak. It's very easily damaged and slowed down. Uh, Last week, remember, I I took the uh, high school teenagers up to GI games. and (laughs) I think every year I get older, it just gets harder to recover. It takes longer to recover. I feel this one. (laughs) Oh, the difference a few years makes. And also, if, if I get a cold or flu, I, I lose five kilos overnight. It takes me, it take me weeks or months to put it back on. I think a few years ago, it took me six months to get back on track. We're, we're weak, aren't we? But our new bodies will be raised in power. They will not be subject to the same limitations and vulnerabilities. Our strength will be renewed and we'll soar on wings like eagles. We will then be able to do what is impossible for now. And my body now is natural. That is, it belongs to this realm of nature, this present temporary existence. It is from the dust of this fallen world and is right at place in this current world. But our future bodies, though still physical, will be supernatural. It will be the perfect vehicle for glorifying God in the new creation. But for now, our bodies have to contend with fitting in with the constraints and limitations of this world. But when our bodies are raised, they will belong to an everlasting realm, not limited by the ways of this current existence. This is our hope. Our future is very much physical. We will have bodies risen and transformed, glorious bodies. We can see why Peter described it as a living hope, because it's absolute and definite. Death is not the end. I think our our current society... And culture view death as the end. Uh, I think last year I, I um, brought to you that there's a slogan going around, especially with young kids at school. It's YOLO, Y O 
L-O. It's you only live once. It's such a, a futile way of thinking. It just means you just live, you die, that's it. There's no hope. <laughs> that, that's another reason I'm so glad that I have Jesus Christ and the hope of being in Christ. For I know that death is not the end and there is more to come. The resurrection means hope and it gives us hope. Hope for us and hope for creation. Hope means that we can keep going. Uh, and if we tire, we must look to the resurrection. Again, from last, the last series, uh, we must let nothing move us. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. It's worth keeping going on for our hope is certain. There is a new body and a new earth to look forward to. We know it's coming because Jesus Christ has been risen, has risen from the dead. So what about our seemingly mundane lives? What, what if our labour seems to be in vain? After sin entered the world, humans were required to endure hardship and toil. Well, the, the work that God entrusted to humanity way back in the Garden of Eden has not been superseded. Not at all. In fact, that the resurrection gives us a renewed hope and motivation to do the creation work of developing society and relationships and stewarding this world. It shows us that this world has a future, that the good work we do now in this world is not in vain. It is worth doing. So whatever we do, raising kids, working, cooking meals, visiting the sick, hard physical labour, whatever we do, all these things are to be done to the glory of God. Sometimes we might feel that our lives are just pretty mundane. But in the resurrection of Jesus... We have this hope, and this hope has begun to be realised. And its scope includes not just our bodies, but the whole world. In his resurrection, we are reborn into a new hope, and it lives in us. God began a resurrection plan, and he will surely finish it.